Hello and welcome to the sixth annual Global Demand Awards. Today I am joined by Elizabeth Raposo, president of production company Outlier Society, which is responsible for the most in-demand drama movie nominee, Creed Three. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So to start off, most important question of the entire discussion, I know you got your BA at Georgetown. I spent a lot of time in and around Washington, D.C. during my college career as well. So I have to ask, when it comes to D.C. food, are you going Ben's Chili Bowl or Old Ebbett Grill? Uh, I am an Old Ebbett Grill fan. Uh, I actually... A uh, little fun fact about me, I interned at the White House when I was a senior at Georgetown and Old Ebbett was very close to the White House. So it was uh, it was the go to post internship hang spot. I do know it's a very popular White House, you know, destination. And <laughs> while I do love Ben's Chili Bowl, I'm relieved to hear you say that because that was the right answer. It is Old Ebbett. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad even though there was a choice, I'm glad I got it right. There we yeah. go. So Elizabeth, you where were named... is it? Where is Ben Chili Bowl? Ben's Chili Bowl. I actually don't know that spot. I unfortunately couldn't tell you the actual location because oh, okay. I was driven there every time. And frankly, we were going at twelve, you know, one in the morning, and there might have been a, yes. an adult beverage or two consumed back in I my understand. youth. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Worth checking out if you ever get back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go back all the time. I'm a big. Georgetown alum supporter. So um, on my next trip, I'll, I was there last summer. So um, I'll I'll try it again on my next trip. Yeah. Though I didn't go to Georgetown I, during an internship, I filmed all of the soccer games for about two seasons. So I, I have an affinity in my heart for the school. That's Thank you. It's, it's a beautiful school. I'm really, yeah. really proud of um, having attended there and loved my experience. So Elizabeth, you were named president of Michael B. Jordan's Outlier Society in 2021 after serving as president of production at Paramount, where you worked closely with Leonardo DiCaprio's Appian Way, Brad Pitt's Plan B, and Martin Scorsese, all of whom had overall deals with the studio. Before that, I believe you were with uh, Darren Aronofsky's Protozoa Pictures. You previously said in interviews you enjoy working with entrepreneurial spirits, which is obvious from that track record. But what else is it about working with these creatives with very specific and distinct visions that has been so attractive to you? Uh, great question. I think, you know, you always uh, draw on your own personal experiences, right, for for um, answers to questions like this. And, you know, I, I grew up in a very um, artistically uh, focused household. My father was a songwriter and my mother was a film and theater critic. So I felt like from an early age, the what the artist's process and what artists went through um, was definitely held in high regard in my home. So I, I had a peek behind that curtain and um, between both of my parents having such a love for the arts and the artists that they worked with, I feel like that kind of by osmosis drifted over to me. Um, and so when I became um, a director's assistant and then a studio executive and now a producer, what is just so attractive about and and what is so attractive and fulfilling about my job is that I, I get to help artists realize their vision. And, you know, that can take many different forms depending on the movie or the television show. But I just love helping the artist fulfill their vision and helping them figure out the best process to do that. A worthy cause and all these artists are lucky because you know for the most part i'm, lucky. Speaking, I'm the lucky one <laughs> lucky. you're lucky as well but i would say generally speaking when a kid tells mom and dad i want to go into hollywood for for my job yeah. it's probably not always met with the most supportive or positive of immediate reactions but it sounds like in your household that was definitely the case it it was i will say i i had a very supportive um very supportive upbringing and i think having you know one parent who was an artist and another parent who helped you know promote and talk about the artist artist work um that was you know i saw all i saw both sides of that which was um a wonderful insight into the world and that has manifested in a very very impressive track record i mean from Mission Impossible, Star Trek, Interstellar, A Quiet Place, Top Gun Maverick, Creed Three, and more. You have extensive experience in both franchise filmmaking and event-based intellectual properties. So I am curious, you know, whether original or part of a pre-established series, what is it about these, these grand genre storytelling pillars do you think creates multi-generational, multicultural worldwide appeal? 
I think for me, you know, I, I, I like to speak first and foremost as a fan, because, you know, as William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. So, you know, one can never really, uh, predict or understand why something was a huge hit or a huge miss. But, you know, for me, being able to work on these large scale uh, films is honestly, it's a dream come true because it's also a, a step into a world, right? And whether that's Ethan Hunt's world of the IMF or um, a boxing dynasty of of creed and and the creed family or going into truly another world like what christopher nolan did in interstellar so for me it's all about the worlds i get to explore um no matter you know what part of the process i'm in so i i think that is also why audiences do love some of these large scale films is that it takes them into uh, world, a, a new world, whether it's, you know, reality based or, or science fiction. You know, as much as I love the movies, I don't know if I want to find myself in the world of Ethan Hunt. I don't think I'm brave enough to survive that world. <laughs> you it could do very... it. You could go for it. You could, you can, you can hang off a plane. You could scale the Burj Khalifa. I appreciate <laughs> that. I somehow I think my my whole career in uh, Hollywood entertainment media has not prepared me for that at all. <laughs> yeah, there's a. <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah. nobody like Tom. Those what he and Chris McQuarrie have done with the stunts and uh, just the experience of those mission movies. It's really it's it's I'm in awe of of them and that whole team. Yeah. And yeah. Similar to what you said, you know, despite being an analyst, I'm a former critic. I got into this industry because I'm a fan. So from that audience perspective, mission accomplished on building those amazing worlds. And I think you obviously guys, uh, the whole outlier team has done that with the Creed movies. They're not some, not only some of the most financially successful entries in the whole Rocky franchise, but Creed yes. 3 is one of the most in-demand action movies worldwide in 2023, prepared analytics data. How important for not only the success of the film, but the longevity of the franchise is developing interest in these movies in audiences outside of America? Because the whole theme of this year's Global Demand Awards is the travelability of content across cultures, across borders. And it seems like a, a wonderful sports story like Creed 3 is exactly that. It's a great question. So the, you know, it, it it was not calculated in any way, but Michael did come to the table in the early days of prep and development on the film and said that he wanted to really expand the global reach uh, of the audience for this movie and give an audience um, a taste of what the real, of what the real boxing universe is like, right? It is an international sport. So it was always part of Michael's plan to expand the visuals in this movie and the characters. We have a um, a Mexican boxer in the film played uh, beautifully by um, Jose Benavides. Um, and, uh, and then as you may have seen in, at the beginning of the film, there is a sequence in South Africa. So that was all a part of Michael's vision, really expanding the visual storytelling of the of the of the Creed universe and showing that boxing is truly an international sport. So he acts, he writes, he directs, he produces, and he has a savvy understanding of the industry and how storytelling can contribute to the commercial side. Can you pass along a message to Michael for me? Can you leave some talent for the rest of us? Because we would all just like a little bit and he's just hogging all of it. He he is amazingly talented. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure much like yourself, like, you know, we've all been watching him since he was a teenager sure. and- the trajectory he's been on since his teen years has just been awesome to watch. And now I, you know, now I have a, a front row seat to it, which is pretty great and very humbling. My brother and I will still call each other from time to time and just go, where's Wallace and hang up the phone. And yeah. that'll be it because I don't think that quote's ever going to uh, uh, leave him. Yeah, <laughs> now, no, it, it definitely it's, I mean, look, that, that show was uh, best in class and still, still best in class. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, you have previously described the Creed 3 development as an iterative process. And I am curious, how much flexibility and room for experimentation and change is there on big event films and franchise films like this, where there is a kind of 
set expectations, set way of doing things. Yeah. I mean, a good example of that is probably to talk about the boxing and all that went into the the boxing and the training on this film. So there is there's improvisation to a point, right? Yeah, because when Michael and the um and the other boxers are in the ring, so whether it was the Adonis versus Damian fight or the um uh, the Felix versus Damian fight or the first fight in the movie, the South Africa fight, which was um, Michael's character um, versus Tony Bellew. Um, all three fights in the film were choreographed and planned to a T, um, not only for uh, the boxers and actors safety, but also for the benefit of our DP, our camera operator, quite literally every department had to be in sync to pull off those fights um, to be not only safe, but also visually dazzling. And so while there were some improvisational elements, maybe on the day, you know, Michael asking to perhaps, you know, turn a shoulder or move right. a glove, um, it, it was it was very, very um, structured and and rigorously structured. Um, and then in the emotional and more dramatic scenes, you know, there were times that in a great way, Michael and his scene partners would be open to, you know, letting the emotion uh, right. move through the scene um, in, a, in, a, in a way that, uh, you know, was right for the time and the space. So we had a beautiful script by yeah. Zach Balin and Keenan Kugler, but um, like anything, you know, actors, when they come with their instrument, um, they can always bring something new and unexpected to a scene. I'm glad you, you specifically highlighted the fights because you've talked about how the final fight scene transforms into this fantasy space. And Michael, as the director, believed the audience would buy in and go on that journey with the characters. Now, as a producer on the film, what do those conversations look like behind the scenes when you're debating where the line is that separates what viewers will and won't get on board with? And when it comes to kind of blending realism and fantasy like that, because as you mentioned, just during the process, different ideas will crop up and maybe changes will want to be made day up. Yeah. The approach to the final fight was... Uh was incredible actually the in the early early days of just development on on the script it was clear on the page that by the time we got into the final fight and specifically the fantasy elements of the final fight as the crowd dissolves away um it was clear that as even when you were reading it on the page you were so locked into the drama between these two former childhood friends and all that had happened in the movie and all that you had learned in, as a reader slash audience goer until that point. So it really was evident on the page that it was going to be an emotional moment. Then we went, uh, then we went about trying to actually pin down what visuals we were going to see when they went into the fantasy space. And that took um, months uh, of, visual look development with our visual effects producer, our visual effects supervisor, Michael, and the department heads of Michael really trying things and articulating very specific elements that he wanted to see if they worked. Obviously now, you know, we started shooting this movie two years ago, so I've, I've, uh, I know every frame of the film intimately, and even just watching it again the other day uh, in preparation for an event, I I still am taken in by that moment in the third fight when the audience dissolves and you are thrust into their shared perspective of the night that their lives changed. You know, when you see the, the prison bars go up, when you see the mattress uh, on the turnbuckle in the corner of the ring, it's it's still it still hits me. It's really powerful. And, you know, kudos to the entire team uh, who pulled off that look and feel and the emotional delivery of that. And to that point, I saw Creed three with my father. He brought his father to Rocky in, uh, I believe, 1977 when originally yeah. it came out. 
And yeah. when we walked out of Creed 3, the first thing he said when I turned to him, like, what'd you think? He goes, I really liked how it differed uh, visually from all the other Rockies that have come before. I've never seen anything like that in a Rocky movie. It was the first thing he picked up on. And I think it goes to show you how experimentation and risk-taking can still have that multi-generational appeal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, when we uh, set off trying to make the film, Michael was also really smart about what he felt he needed to bring to this experience, uh, you know, for the viewer, you know, with every movie now, you have to show the audience that you are doing something different, right? You you want to keep their attention, you want to bring them in, you want to dazzle them, you want to move them. So Michael really, from the early days, knew that that final fight had the potential to be something like we've never seen in a boxing or sports movie. And he was right. So to leapfrog off that kind of sentiment, one reason I think Creed 3 is impressive is because it almost in a way reverse engineered standard franchise development in that the, the third film in the series, it doubles as both a family drama about new phases of life. And it really establishes a father daughter relationship, which isn't often seen in the sports genre. But it's also an origin story simultaneously. Uh, now I recognize Michael, and screenwriters Keenan Kugler and Zach Balin play a significant role in crafting that narrative. But how conscious are you and the whole team of subverting expectations, trying to create something that kind of runs counter to standard entrenched storytelling fare or, or what audiences have come to expect? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> again, just from my perspective, having worked on many longstanding franchises over the course of my studio life, um, you know, I had the pleasure of working with incredible multi hyphenates who always wanted to push the envelope and show something new when they were coming back to a role they had already played. And so taking that philosophy and translating it over to Creed, the idea was always to shift the paradigm of this franchise. Like, yes, it will always be a Creed movie. It will always have its heart in the Rocky canon, it will always be a boxing movie. But we asked ourselves every day, but what else can it be for a viewer who's showing up and seeing this in, you know, in a theater? And when we started to really shape the paradigm of, uh, of, it, of it being also a bit of a noir thriller, because, you know, the character of Damien does come into uh, Adonis's life out of the past and uh, sets Adonis on this incredible emotional journey that, you know, we now see in the final product of the film. So it was discussing really the paradigm of the movie that, that helped, I think, Michael continue to fulfill his vision of what every scene and sequence needed to be Yes, the family material is just so winning and stunning. And I have to, you know, make a reference to Mila, the daughter right now. She was Wonderful. just so incredible. What what an actress and what a bright future she will have. Um, but yes, it was uh, it was very much a part of our discussions, how to bring a new look and feel and paradigm to the franchise. You know, I'm ready for the time jump where Creed's daughter is the world champion in the women's division. I'm, I'm ready for that story. Let's bring that on. Free idea right there. Al Iyer can take it. <laughs> I love it. We actually, we created a comic book uh, with the incredible guys at Boom Studios and it's all focused on the Amara character and she's a little bit older than she is in Creed 3. So uh, check out the comic book. It's available in, at your favorite comic book sellers. But I think you'll be given that pitch that you just gave me. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I am really glad that you actually brought up uh, Outlier's work in comic books because, you know, your role as president of Outlier Studio, uh, Society requires you to oversee production and de development for all aspects of the business. And the production company itself still isn't even 10 years old after being founded in 2016. So I'm still very young. But in today's highly competitive, highly fragmented media environment, do production companies like Outlier need to expand 
into new businesses and new storytelling formats that fall outside of quote unquote traditional entertainment, like complementing movies with comic books, like doing things that are slightly outside of the box. I mean, the fun thing about what we're doing and building over here is we just like to find great stories that deserve to be told. And then we feel we will help those storytellers find the right medium for that, right? So whether it's uh, a little piece of the Creed universe that makes more sense as a comic book story for now, great. If it's uh, an amazing true story that deserves its own podcast or docu-series, great. If it's a book, uh, like we recently optioned this incredible bestseller called The Fourth Wing, um, which is um, on all the bestseller lists uh, this year. It's pretty, or not this year, from last year, going into this year too. Um, and that's going to be an event series at Amazon. So we, you know, we just like to find great worlds, great stories, and then we will help those artists find the right way to tell them. And I love that the fans then can have different pathways into the world, whether it's comic books, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a full blown movie franchise, we can just yeah. get into that ecosystem and, and spend a little bit more time with our favorite characters and stories. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, that's the great thrill about what we do, right. Is just, we get to find great stories and, and make them into um, the thing that they deserve to be made into. I'm a proud couch potato, so I'm all for it, consuming as much <laughs> of this as possible. I love, um, it. I love so it. So aside from Creed 4, what other upcoming outlier society projects are you particularly excited about? Because I know personally, I'm a huge fan of the fantasy tril trilogy, The Broken Earth. So I'm very much looking forward to Outlier and Sony's collaboration on that series. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm the 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 fun thing about what I do is I, you know. I love everything that we're working on. So uh, I, the Broken Earth trilogy is going to be extraordinary. Um, our our partners at TriStar have been wonderful and supportive of that. The fourth wing adaptation, which will be an event series at Amazon, uh, which is where we have our overall deal. Um, that's going to be wonderful. You know, it, I would say you pick the right, you pick the right two that, you know, that are top of mind today. Well, that's just my nerdy sensibilities kicking in where I'm like, oh, <laughs> fantasy, sci-fi, those types of things, yeah. I'm all over it. Yeah. So then yeah. last question, and I'll get you out of here. I know you're busy oh, okay. and you're, you're, you're more than welcome to choose uh, Adonis Creed if you like, but if you could have dinner with one fictional character, who would it be and why? Oh, wow. Great question. Um, I'm leaving you on a stumper. I have... I have two. Um, my favorite novel of all time is The Great Gatsby. So I actually would love to have dinner with, with Jay and see, you know, and talk a little. And then um, my favorite play of all time is Hamlet. So I would love to, I would, I would, I would like to meet that Danish prince. <laughs> well, as someone whose Twitter handle is the great Catsby for my last name, I fully endorse all of these. Is it really? Oh my yes, God, that's it amazing. <laughs> it, it, a, a lucky uh, confluence of loving the book, of course, and having the right last name to slot right, right. in there. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. It's so wonderful to hear about Creed 3 and all the amazing things going Ooh. on at Outlier Society. And we are so looking forward to what 2024 and beyond has to offer from you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, making this movie was just pure joy. And uh, Michael did such an amazing job. So getting to talk about it a little is, is always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your kind words and for having me.